Today truly is a great day to be a ward. Welcome students, faculty, staff, Dr. Smith, Mr. Mayo, distinguished representatives, uh, Mr. Broder, Mr. Wong, uh, Ms. Ms. Hull, uh, Chief Smith, Chief Sullivan. I'd also like to recognize um, Mr. Tom Lyons, a Wakefield resident who has uh, put a lot of effort into making today happen, as well as a uh, Wakefield High School graduate by the name of Phil McCall, who is also involved in organizing today's event. Phil's family is here, and Phil is also here. He's a graduate of 2008, and uh, he has um, been involved in orchestrating the helicopter, and so is Mr. Lyons. So thank you all for that. Uh, members, obviously, of our military, state and local police departments and fire departments and of course our local veterans who join us every year in our memorial day assembly which you are all invited back to this uh this may um please um, consider coming because it is one of the most special events that we hold here at wakefield memorial high school and um it's something that i know the students as a tradition pass on in terms of their respect and uh care for our um, our veterans here in our town and surrounding towns. I'd like to thank you all again for your service to our country. So I have the privilege of opening the presentation uh, for today. And as you know, we have two honored guests joining us uh, here to share their experiences and, and take some questions from you all um, because they, uh, they said this is the most important part of their day. They're meeting the governor and all that stuff later, but uh, um, one of the honorees just, just mentioned to me this is the most important part of their day, so that's a real special thing. Um, I'd like to welcome them one at a time to start the ceremony. And as many of you have read and know already, the Congressional Medal of Honor is our nation's highest military citation bestowed upon an individual serving in the armed services of the United States. It's given to those who have exhibited valor and action against an enemy force. And um, there aren't too many um, in the country who have been awarded uh, this uh, citation. Um, I've read in the papers uh, for the past couple of days how much this convention means to the city of Boston and how much it means to those uh, Medal of Honor honorees. And so they've come to Boston um, three times, I believe. This is the third time. It's the only city that they repeat their convention in, and they're really proud to be in this area. And um, I'm hoping today we'll add to that experience for the two gentlemen who are here. Um, Waco Memorial High School is privileged to host two gentlemen awarded this medal this morning. Escorted by Ms. Um, Tori Trindali, who's a senior here, I'd like you to welcome Mr. Harvey Burnham, who served in Vietnam in the U.S. Marine Corps.
Dennis Morrell, and Brian Kirk from the musical company. I'd like to introduce Steve Marino, who's a senior. He's going to be reading a description of Mr. Harvey Barnum, who will then uh, speak to us about uh, his experiences. Steve? Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, on behalf of Wakefield Memorial High School, I'd just like to say thank you to um, all of our guests and to the members of our military who are here. Uh, thank you for your service. It's, it's really an honor and a, a privilege. I'm very humbled to be able to speak in front of you guys today. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity, at the risk of his own life, above and beyond the call of duty, when the company was suddenly pinned down by a hail of extremely accurate enemy fire and was quickly separated from the remainder of the battalion, Lieutenant Barnum quickly made a hazardous reconnaissance of the area, seeking targets for his artillery. Finding the rifle company commander mortally wounded and the radio operator killed, he, with complete disregard for his safety, gave aid to the dying commander, then removed the radio from the dead operator and strapped it to himself. He immediately assumed command of the rifle company and moving once into the midst of heavy fire, rallying and giving encouragement to all units, reorganized them to replace the loss of key personnel and led their attack on enemy positions from which the deadly fire continued to come. His sound and swift decisions and obvious calm served to stabilize the badly decimated units, and his gallant example stood as he exposed repeatedly to, to point out that targets served as an inspiration to, to all. Provided with two armed helicopters, he moved fearlessly through the enemy fire to control the air attack against the firmly entrenched enemy level while skillfully directing one platoon in a successful counterattack on the key enemy positions. Having thus cleared a small area, he requested a, and directed the landing of two transport helicopters for the evacuation of dead and wounded. He then assisted in mopping up the final seizure of the battalion's objective. His gallant initiative and heroic conduct reflected great credit upon himself and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the U.S. Naval Service. Now let's all please stand and applaud and welcome Mr. Barnum. Well, being a Connecticut guy, it's great to be back in New England, I've got to tell you. I stand before you today as a, as a grateful American. Grateful that I got to be born, live, grow up, be educated in the greatest country in the world, the United States of America. I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to wear the cloth of this great nation and serve as a United States Marine, both in peacetime and in war. And I'm grateful that I've been entrusted with this coveted medal, and I've worn it for almost 50 years now in honor of those great Marines and phenomenal Navy corps that I got to lead on the field of battle. You know, the Medal of Honor Society, we all feel that the future of this great country lies in the hands of our youth, because you are the future leaders. You are the future admirals and generals, congressmen, senators, doctors, lawyers, school teachers, police, firemen. You're preparing by your education here at Wakefield to be ready to step up and take on some responsibilities. And I say to you, you're, you're, you're climbing a ladder of success. And I want you to set your goals high. Set them way up. And as you climb that ladder, never say I can't, never say it's too hard, and take the word failure out of your vocabulary. Because if you make up your mind to do something, you can do it. And if you come upon something that you can't cope with, you can't solve, you don't know which direction to take. That's what your instructors, your teachers, your coach, your counselors are all about. So you go to them and ask them, and they'll give you a little guidance. But you've got to be the one to admit that you may need a little assistance. They're there to get you going down the right track. So confide in me. 
Because as I said, you're climbing that ladder of success. You are building a foundation for the rest of your life right now at Wakefield High School. And you know when you build a foundation that you're going to put walls and a house on, that foundation's got to be strong. Because when you put a foundation in that's not strong and you put walls on it and then a roof, pretty soon the walls are going to fall down and the roof's going to cave in. So the most important part of your life right now is to build that strong foundation upon which you're going to build the walls of life. And when you graduate from college or out in corporate America or in the military, then you put the roof on that house. And that roof's going to stay there for a long time if you've had a strong foundation. So that's what you're doing now. You're building that strong foundation. And it's up to you. There's no free lunch out there, my friends. There's no free lunch. You're going to get what you work for. If you don't work for it, you're not going to get it. But if you work for it, it's out there, and you can get it. So that's the challenge that you have right now. And there's one other thing I'd like to leave with you. And then Dr. Ingram is going to be up here, and then we're going to open it up to questions and talk about some things you want to talk about. You all take the chemistry. You all know that every action has a reaction, right? Okay. So when you're making a decision in life, that's an action. Take it a reaction. Think about, is that going to make mom and dad, grand and grand, my coach, is that going to make them happy? Is it the right thing to do at the right time for the right reason? It better be. You all under a lot of peer pressure, and a lot of you will bow to peer pressure. And then that reaction may not be what you really want. I've got to tell you something. Everything you do today is going to affect the rest of your life. You cannot change what you did yesterday, but you can affect tomorrow and years out. So always do the right thing. And if it means walking away from a gang because they want to do something stupid, then do it. Be your own self. Be your own self. Make your own way. And the most important person you have to make happy and proud of, that's yourself. Okay? So I want you to, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. And the other thing is, I feel like I'm talking to my grandmother right now. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, be careful what you put on there. It is there forever. It is there forever. And a lot of you think it's cute to show a risque photo of yourself at a party. Oh, you know, you know what I'm talking about, huh? All right. So you might get a few laughs. Everybody that has access to the internet can see that photo. There's some bad people out there. There's some predators. And they're looking for stuff like that. Because they figured if you're dumb enough to put it on Facebook, then maybe you're an easy prey. That's reality. You better face up to it. And then some of the comments that you put on Twitter. That's there forever. So you're out of college and you're going to corporate America for a big interview. You know the personnel department has looked at everything, your Facebook and your Twitter, since you were in Wakefield High School. And if there's a trend in there that you're really not a quality person, or you've done many, many dumb things, and you're there and it's up between you and someone else for that job, and they are perfectly down the middle, that's who's going to get the job. So what I'm saying is, what you're doing now, at this stage of life, is you climb that ladder of life and reach out to those goals. It's going to be with you. So build that strong foundation so that the walls of life and the roof that you cap it off on, the roof of marriage, children, family, will remain intact and not cave in. 
So good luck with God's speed. Head step for the beat and drum and stay in step. So 
I'd like to thank the training room and I'd like to invite them back up and give uh, the two gentlemen here the opportunity to answer some questions if there are any from our um, student body or our faculty. Does anybody have a question out there that they'd like to ask? Well, while you're thinking about it, let me tell you something else. <laughs> War is horrifying, not glorifying. Those of us, and there are many World War II gents, pre-war and Vietnam veterans here in the audience, and they'll tell you, war is horrifying. But the reason we have a strong military is to protect the freedoms that you and I enjoy every day. There, we live right now in the most disturbing, unsettled, volatile world that I have seen in my life. There are people who despise everything that you and I, your parents, grandparents, Uncle Joe and Aunt Sadie, believe in. They want to tear us down. They want to change us to their ways. We've been fighting isms. For a long time. World War II, we fought totalitarianism, Nazism. Then in Korea and Vietnam, we fought another ism, communism. And now we're fighting the toughest ism that we've ever fought terrorism. There are religious fanatic fundamentalists that want to tear us down who want to destroy our way of life, our democracy, everything we believe in. We can't let that happen. That's the reason we have a strong military. A strong military is a deterrent against these bad guys. If we have a strong military, they know when they take us on what's going to happen. We're going to drive them in the ground like a pit stick. We're not going to put up with it. But that's the reason we have the military. And I got to tell you, the World War II gents are the greatest generation. That's what Tom Brokaw said, right? You read that in the book? This sailor and this Marine represent the newest, greatest generation of the United States of America. And they represent the hundreds of thousands of soldiers, sailor, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen who wear the cloth, who voluntarily raise their hand. There is no craft. You don't have to serve in the military. It's something to think about, though. Serve in the military, get back to the country, they gave you everything. Well, they have. They take an oath. And they solemnly swore to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I know the enemies used to be foreign all the time, but we got a lot of homegrown terrorists now. And these young whippersnappers are ready to take them on and, and, the, and the, those they represent. So uh, that's the reason we have a strong military. And uh, like I said, uh, and I also like to recognize uh, the law enforcement folks that are here. You know, last Friday was the 14th anniversary of 9-11. Most of you were about four years old then, so you don't really remember. But I want to tell you, it changed all our lives that day. But you know what? I look at the, the positives. You know, another thing you learn in math, you put two negatives together and you get a positive. But I look at the positive aspects 9-11. It brought this country together. We came together, one team, one fight, because someone was trying to take us down. But we sort of uh, dropped that pack of concern and patriotism because uh, life's been pretty good. You know why it's been pretty good? You know why we haven't been attacked? Law enforcement, another thing after 9-11, law enforcement agencies, intelligence gathering agencies, 
all around this great country came together. They started sharing information, communicating with each other. It wasn't about them, it was about us. So I'm going to tell you, you won't see this, but they've taken down some very serious plots before they had a chance to exit. So, you know, show the men and women in blue the respect that they earn, deserve, because they're there for you. And I know today uh, I'm a little concerned around this great country of people who don't respect law enforcement. And it hurts me. It's hard enough to lose an American in wartime against an enemy that's a declared. But to fight these terrorists that just come up and shoot a police officer, I'm going to tell you, that doesn't say much about this country. So again, if you see here anything that's out of place, step forward, do your duty, and make sure that the officials know that. Because together, we will win. We will win. You know, spell the word America in your mind. What are the last four letters? I can. As Americans, we can do anything we put our minds to. Okay, who's got a question? Who's got a question? Stand up. Speak up. Reserves. This was a reserve conference. 
in this room. We all split. I went up on the roof of the, of the uh, uh, country club. I could see the Pentagon smoke building. Well, I knew we were at war. So I went down in the club room with that big TV and I watched the towers go down. Well, they told us, don't go back to the Pentagon. I lived 23 miles away. It took me seven hours to get home. And I had red lights in my car. So, and then I got up on the next morning and got to work early, about five o'clock. It, it was about midnight that night before all my people were accounted for. We had a recall system and I, I made sure that we put that, that, that communications tree in, in motion. It was about midnight when I found out everybody in my work for me got home. And so I got to work in the morning, no lights, I'm up on the fifth deck, I'm up the ladder way and I was sitting on my desk and fire broke off the ceiling over my desk. And it traveled along those big wooden beams uh, over three corridors. The fire department came in and said, get out. And I moved my, my, my operations to the Marine Corps Command Center up on the hill at the Navy Annex. But that day changed our lives forever. And as I said, uh, we came together, um, we went across the pond and we took on the bad guys. And as we know now, it's been, what, 12 years it is, and we've been at war. So one of my concerns is that we pulled out of Iraq, we pulled out of Afghanistan. The American public is impatient. They want to get things done. They get tired of war. Well, we all get tired of war, but sometimes it takes a while. So another concern I have is our friends around the world are saying, you know, if we get in trouble, the United States comes, are they going to stay or are they going to pull out? They pull out of Somalia, they pull out of Iraq, pull out of Afghanistan. So uh, uh, in the eyes of the world, uh, we're not looked upon as favorably. It's only because of the pressure the American public puts on the politicians and that is uh, to bring the boys home. You ask the boys and the girls to raise their hand, support and defend. They want to stay, get the mission done, be successful, get him out, come home. Okay. All right, next question. Okay, one more. One more. You ask a question, your picture gets in the school newspaper. What do you got? How did I decide I want to go to the military? Oh, that's a good story. <laughs> senior year in my high school in Cheshire, Connecticut. Got all the senior boys in there, and they had all the recruiters come in. And the Army recruiter got up to speak, and there was these cat calls and whistles. And then the Navy recruiter got up, and there was these cat calls and whistles and comments in the audience in the Air Force. This old grizzly Marine gunny got up slapped his hand on the desk and said, there's no one in this room that I want in my Marine Corps. You're undisciplined. You're unmotivated. Then he began to chew the faculty out the back of the room for letting it all happen. Pick up his stuff and walk off the stage. He used to say, I lined up at his desk out in the hallway. Here's a man who knew what he wanted to do, was mission-oriented, disciplined, wouldn't take any shenanigans. I said, you know what, that's a pretty good way to be. And uh, so that's the reason I joined the Marine. Okay. Doc, why did you join the Navy? <laughs> Doc, why did you join the Navy? Didn't have much choice at that point. <laughs> uh, at the time I joined the Navy, I was out of high school, and much like our economy today, the jobs are hard to find. I did not have the money at that point for education. I uh, was not a very good student. And uh, it seemed like a, a good thing to do at the time. I joined the Navy as an aviation electronics uh, guarantee, and I decided that I didn't want to sit behind a bench and solder and unsolder radios. And I uh, caught the monkey when I was in boot camp and got isolated, and we had a, a series of Final meningitis going on. 
As I watched these foremen who were dedicated to their jobs, I have never seen such dedication before and had no idea what it was about. But I decided that that's what I really wanted. I wanted what they had, and that was the decision, the dedication to do their job right. So I became a foreman. Thank you for being here today, gentlemen. This is a really once-in-a-lifetime experience for us here at Wakefield Memorial High School. I'd just like to introduce uh, Joe Boudreau and Julianne Bork, both seniors, who would like to uh, just say uh, one last thank you to you both for coming, and I uh, believe they have a little um, gift and some things to say. here at Wakefield Memorial High School, I am so pleased and proud to be thanking Mr. Harvey Barnes and Mr. Robert Ingram for their bravery and commitment to our service. Winston Churchill once stated, never before in the course of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. I firmly believe that this aptly describes our thoughts here today as we cannot thank Mr. Barnum and Mr. Ingram enough for their service. It is indeed a privilege for us to be honored by the presence of these two recipients, our nation's highest military honor. So on behalf of the school, I know it's not much, but we'd like to give you both a bag. <laughs> that has something in it. Mr. Barnum's and Mr. Ingram's story uh, to our, in our service to our country is an inspiration to us all. And we should not just take what they told us today as a memory or a mere thought. We should learn from it and apply it to our normal day life and our normal routines. So thank you again. And on this note, I want to welcome our principal, Ms. Metropolis. So, just to close the ceremony, I know our gentlemen are going to be actually escorted out and they're going to be heading uh, via state police escort back out to the helicopter um, and we'll, uh, as a school community, be escorted back to our classes. But uh, I'd just like to say one last thank you to our guests and all of their liaisons, uh, all of our representatives and parents who are here today. Uh, all of you for your attention and your focus here. Uh, Dr. Smith, I forgot to mention earlier today, our superintendent, uh, members of the school committee, Ms. Morgan is here as the chair. Um, we, we really, uh, as a school, I, I'm always so proud of these events. We have them so rarely, and um, this is a, a, a great place to be. It's a great place to come to work every day. For all of us, it's our second home. And uh, for me, it's an absolute great day to be a warrior. So thank you all.